part third in three parts about our reaching out to immigrant refugee folks. And one of our speakers is with us, the other is trying to get here through the snow from the east side. Luda is with us. Luda Pinchuk is uh, Ukrainian, so there might be some interesting questions there. There, are, there were a few last copies of my brilliant lecture <laughs> <laughs> on um, the Bible and our heritage, frankly, our entire heritage is one of the immigrants and refugees. Um, so last week and this week, we wanted to really put a practical face to the, the programs and uh, groups like US Together, Us Together, who help immigrant refugees get resettled here in Cleveland and all that that takes. Um, you, those of you who take the Plain Dealer, there's quite an article today about five people getting together in any association and doing this. I think that's a little crazy, but uh, we'll let our speakers address that. And when Elizabeth Kuzman uh, dashes in toward the end of the class, we will welcome her. They are more than willing to stay and answer questions. So Luda, please come on up. We're so glad that you are here. I did tell her that the school where I volunteer now has seven Ukrainians, and you pick them out because they're the blondes. <laughs> They're the only one. Yeah, All the <laughs> so, Nuno, welcome to LPC, and uh, she is with us together. Hi, everybody. My name is Luda Ludmila Pinchuk, but I go by Luda because no one can pronounce my Ludmila full name. So, uh, I'm from Ukraine. I'm going to tell you about myself a little bit. I'm an immigrant myself. It's okay. Uh, are you? Are you, do you she, could you hear me? Yeah. Oh. This is that? Oh, wow. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm from Ukraine and I'm an immigrant myself. I came to the United States 20 years ago when I didn't know what I was doing, but I don't regret my decision. I'm a US citizen now and I love this country and I, as I told you, I feel like I belong. So uh, our working, uh, Us Together is an organization which was founded by actually Ukrainian refugees. They had a vision and actually came through. So, uh, and also we employ a lot of immigrants and refugees to work with us because this is much better. People understand the roots and culture, you know, and upbringing, so it, it helps us all. <coughs> so, I started with us together in 2010 as an interpreter because I speak four languages, so I was interpreter. And uh, in 2014, by accident, I became case manager. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was a coach. I was approached by, by our director, who uh, Helen Takanova. Maybe you heard about her. She was Russian from Russia, from Moscow. And one day, she called me and she says, "Do you want to become case manager?" And I said, "Oh no." <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she says, "How about you try this one case? And if you don't like it, you don't have to continue." So I remember that was 2014, the end of the year, and I uh, like, okay. She explained me what I have to do, and I'm like new and everything. So I'm coming to the airport and there's a family of 10 arriving. Mother, pregnant mother, like probably like seven or eight months pregnant, and seven more children. So I'm looking at them coming from the you know uh, elevator, I'm like, oh my God, what I got myself into. <laughs> <laughs> but after I was, stuck, was uh, I was helping them step by step, and I really enjoyed this process, and I, that was like great satisfaction to help people and be able to change their lives to, to better to give them a good advice you know, and guide them through uh, their life in the United States. So actually after that one case, I agreed to actually continue working as a case manager. So after that, I was overseeing like all Eastern European cases. Uh, and now I'm a senior case manager at Us Together and I'm uh, responsible of overseeing like all direct services provided by our case managers to our clients. Wow. Yes. So I'm gonna tell you, I know Kevin Cherries last time told you a lot about technicality and everything, so I'm gonna tell you about programs we have for refugees, okay? So uh, when refugees uh, come to the United States, the very first program which they go through called RFP, Resettlement and Placement. So this program runs for, uh, from 30 days to 90 days. And during this program, refugees have to be uh, found the housing, you know, apply for food stamps, for Medicaid, uh, enroll, get enrolled in schools, like start their life, you know, uh, 
great basics to start your life in the US. But this 90 days is really like really short time, you know. It depends from family to family, but basically I can tell this is not enough. And we try our best to make people uh, like start them for the good life, but sometimes, you know, they need a lot more uh, attention and help. So we also have like another program called PC, Preferred Communities. This is program for people who have uh, vulnerabilities and they need like more attention and more help. It depends like on different vulnerabilities, like single mothers, like people with severe health condition, mental or physical, like uh, survivors of torture, single fathers, like different vulnerabilities, and we can enroll those people in this preferred communities program, which runs for like one year, and then could be extended like for two years, or in severe cases, three. Then we have another program which called Matching Grant. This program is responsible for enrolling people, making finding job, jobs for people, to prepare them for you know job interviews, to we run like digital literacy classes through this program. So sometimes people come like it depends what country actually. Yeah, like for example, people from Eastern Europe, you know, Ukrainians, Russians, they can navigate the system better, you know, but people from Africa, this is different story, so we have the like, digital literacy classes to teach them basics so they can, you know, uh, use their phones and use computers to look for jobs and stuff like this. And also we have uh, a lot of connections with different like factories, like different uh, organizations which are employing refugees even if they don't speak language. So we help them to get employed, we teach them how to get to those uh, workplaces, we provide them like transportation orientation on the spot. It was during COVID, it was really bad situation because we couldn't go. But uh, other than that, we just trying to situate them for success as much as possible. So uh, they can get employed and can get earn some income and start life in the United States and feel like they you know, actually feel home. So uh, through this program and, and matching grant, we have another program called MED and uh, Micro Enterprise Development. This program is uh, developed specifically for people who uh, want to open their own businesses in the United States. Yes, because some, uh, and I'm going to, I'm just giving you a brief overview, but I'm going to give you personal examples. <coughs> so those people uh, have like passion or dream of some op opening their business on their own, but of course being new in the United States, they, they have no idea what to do. They don't know the process, so we have a, we teach them uh, how to start, you know, how to apply for licenses, how to, uh, we, we connect with mentors who have similar businesses and they help them navigate, the, you know, everything and they explain in the process. And we have like many successful stories of our refugees like making jewelries, like uh, doing clo uh, clothing, like uh, some of our Ukrainian ladies, she paints like ornaments, Christmas or any you know, Christmas or any occasion you want. Like making candles, like making clothes, like uh, bakeries, like a lot of different uh, businesses. So we try and, this is okay. I, I forgot to tell you this matching grant program, employment, it could be uh, up to 180 or to 40 days, depends how, how long, you know, it's needed. Because uh, if somebody gets employed right away in the first uh, 60 days, you know, they don't need as much attention, somebody who cannot find job no matter sometimes you, you take them to the interview but we cannot predict and they're going to get accepted or not you know so up to 140 days and matching grant program it doesn't have to be like immediate all refugees who are in country up to the five years they can apply so for example if they arrive today and they have they don't know what they want to do you know what i'm saying and they have other like issues to take, like basic issues to take care of. They don't know what business they want to open or what they want to do later. So up to five years they can come back and say, hey, I have this vision and I want to open this business, please help me. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to give you some examples. So uh, one of our, okay, uh, we have a Ukrainian case manager in our office. She allowed me to disclose her name. Her name is Nadia. So she mostly uh, works now with uh, Ukrainians who come through U4U U program. She is helping those families to uh, get situated in the United States, like, but it doesn't go as far as R&P, 
because uh, uh, we're not allowed to provide as many services. You know, the uh, U4U program basically goes only like referral and connection. So uh, she and we have another guy whose name is Paolo. He, he's helping her to take people to medical appointment, health screen, to uh, school enrollment, like really, really basics. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about Nadia a little bit more. So she uh, came to the United States in 2019. I remember uh, April 1st, 5th, because that was that is my son's birthday, so I remember the day. So she came in 2019, her, her husband, and three kids. So she is a really high, highly educated uh, lady. She was uh, she's MBA. She was running like uh, she was uh, manager of the big bank uh, bank in Chernobyl, her home city in Ukraine. But here she comes and no English, you know. She she like she was really like lost and and it's really easy, it's really hard to when you were like when you're highly educated and you had a good job back in your country and you had to leave because it was you know we hope everybody has different reasons but then you come to the United States and you realize you have to start from very beginning and this is really overwhelming. So. I spoke to her and uh, she figured out, she says, you know what, I really love baking, but I, I, she, had, she says, I was, she was just baking for her and her family back in Ukraine and she couldn't, you know, she was busy and I told her, you know what, we have this MD program, how about you start baking here and sell your products? And she says, no, no, I cannot do it. I said, we will help, you just trust me. So she said, yes. So we, this MD program, we uh, actually taught her how to Make, how to make proper labels. We taught her how to start her business. She went through uh, like training, she, but it was easy with her because she is MBA, you know, so she was basically, she knew more than she had to know. So uh, her business was really successful. She still makes till now on the, I guess, weekends. But later, she went to, uh, she enrolled in a tri -C and went through English classes and I'm talking to her someday like, hi, how are you doing? And she says, yeah, I really like this bank, uh, bacon, but I think, she says, I would miss like people interaction, you know, and stuff like this. And we had the opening at that time, uh, we were looking for case manager for Ukrainian cases. And I told her, how about you come work with us? And she says, no, no, I don't think I can, I said, you will be able to do it, just trust me. I said, you trust me first time, trust me now, you can do it. <laughs> So she said yes, and she came, and now she is joking. She says, I motivated her to bake, and I motivated her not to bake. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she is really great, and she is orient detail-oriented, which is you know, really great in her job. And she became so passionate, and she actually likes it a lot. So this is like success story. Okay, so uh, another family came from Ukraine. That was 2018. A uh, family of uh, uh, four people, uh, mother, father, and two kids. And uh, one of the uh, daughters was like five years old, and she could not talk, could not walk properly, could not totally like late in her development, and they told us she has seizures from time to time. So uh, I connected her, I mean, we connected her to, I guess, best doctors in Cleveland Clinic because they told us no one back in Ukraine, they couldn't have, a, they didn't have access to good, you know, uh, medicine. So no one in Ukraine could actually figure out what was going on because they used to live in the village. And uh, sometimes people, you know, uh, maybe they were not persuasive enough, but it's everybody's different story. So they couldn't get to the better, you know, uh, doctors. So child was not diagnosed properly and they didn't know what was going on. So she came to the United States and uh, it was really big hope, so we can help. So we tried our best. So we connected her with uh, epilepsy specialist because she was having, having like uh, epileptic seizures like basically a couple times per day. Ooh. Yeah. So she was hospitalized in Rainbow, Rainbow. That was Cleveland Clinic. They told us go to Rainbow Babies University. It's better because they have specialists. So we went to university, Rainbow Babies, and. Uh, they were like really great. They hospitalized her, uh, and they were trying to figure out what was going on. And she was hospitalized probably for two weeks. 
they try to like different kind of medicines, they try to uh, like everything, they try to treat diagnose and then they say like they really were like not sure what's going on. So they suggested go speak to genetic doctors. But they <coughs> when my babies were able to figure out the medicine which was taken under control by scissors, so she is not going, you know, into season like a couple times per day. It was like maybe once or twice per week or so, but still. And she was not developing properly, she could not, because after those scissors, she needs to take some time to uh, recover, you know, so she could not talk, talk, could not speak, could not eat herself, and that was really heartbreaking. So we went to genetics, I went with them, and the uh, doctor was really great. She, was, she did uh, genetic testing on her, and she figured out that kid has a really rare medical disease, uh, tuberous sclerosis, which actually, when you have this disease, like multiple, multiple uh, non non cancerous, I guess, uh, developments go through all your organs. Like you know, it could be like any like a kidney, like lungs, like I mean anything. So child had uh, growth in her brain, which prevented her from you know developing properly and. Uh, that was really <coughs> like heartbreaking to hear. But they say they have to test like her mother, father, and the sister to figure out where she got it from. And uh, so we went through all testing with them. And uh, in the end, they say it was on mother's side. Mother had the same kind of, you know, uh, chrom chromosomes. chromosomes, yes, uh, malfunction, I would say, whatever. So uh, they, uh, uh, said mother can also develop different tumors, like benign, but different tumors and different organs, and she needs attention now. So, okay, now we took mother on board because she was feeling okay, but she says her vision was blurry and she was coughing. So in the end, we took her through every specialties and a doctor of genetics, she told us like, not every specialist knows about this tumor sclerosis and she was telling us which specialist we have to make appointment with to make sure you know she's taken care of. So uh, they checked her they checked her thoroughly and uh, they found like her lungs were not okay but uh, after a year it was steady so nothing was going on and uh, she was more or less good. And last year she developed something in her ovaries, so she came back to me and we enrolled her again because this PC program, uh, up to five years also, she was enrolled once. We did what we could to make her as self-sufficient or taking her connected, you know. And when something happens like drastic again, they can come back and get enrolled again. So we enrolled her again, we connected her with doctor, she was having surgery, and now she is recovering. But the main thing is she, is she knew it could happen. She was more or less prepared. She knew what to do, where to go. I mean, she connected with me and I connected her with doctors, but she, and actually she's so strong mentally. She has this like really sick daughter and she herself is sick, but if you meet her, you would never tell. Like she's so strong and she's so, and she's so grateful, first of all. Mm -hmm. So this is mother, but back to the daughter, yes. When people come to Cleveland yes. and they're with U.S. together, mm -hmm. do you know before if yes. they have certain medical, psychological, whatever kinds of challenges? Mostly you do. Mostly we do. We have like a, a special form like SMC, Significant Medical Condition Form, which says what kind of uh, disease people have, but it's not always correct, you know, diagnosis might not be always correct. And not all people, sometimes people develop, develop some diseases right here in the United States. So we don't know, we, we, couldn't have, we couldn't have knowledge before. But mostly if it's diagnosed and severe, we do not. So in this case, if you know exactly what it is, we connect with neighborhood family practice clinic. Sometimes like we had a, I got a little bit off topic, but we uh, had a case where it was like a um, family arriving and the uh, husband had a brain tumor, so we knew it ahead. So when we went to the airport, we had a 
We could call ambulance if we needed. We had a wheelchair. We had the doctors on call. So if something was happening, and also those cases, they do travel with medical doctor. If that severe medical condition, significant medical condition, they do not come along. They always have a escort. So a uh, medical doctor escorts them kindly and uh, brings them to the. Uh, we have to sign a paper, like we, we are actually, you know, they arrive, everything, and we, uh, yes. Did I miss something? So how is all this funded? Okay, Elizabeth is going to go and find it. <laughs> oh, she came on time. Uh, okay. And I'm going to, okay, <laughs> that's her, okay. I'm going to leave her, so I'm just so, that's, that's, her so, that's okay with you. So, this is Elizabeth Kuzman, who's also come to share with us. So I'll finish the story, then we can share how about it. Okay, so I'm going to finish this one story, and if you need more, I'll tell you more. So back to the child with scissors, right? She was, uh, when, she, when she was diagnosed properly, they were able, the doctors were able to, to figure like proper treatment for her. So now uh, we enroll, we can help her to get enrolled in school for special kids. And uh, they did a great job. So now she's, uh, that was 2018, so now she's like 10 years old. So she attends school. Yeah, so her scissors stop. She is able to attend school. She can get on the bus her, on her own. She can get off the bus on her own. She's still slowly developing, but compared to what it was, this is like huge progress. And the parents are so happy. They came to the United States and they were able to make her their child better. So, okay. If you need more stories, I have a bunch. <laughs> so now this is. I just want to say, my name is Elizabeth, I'm the site director here at Cleveland for us together. This is the, my first time at this uh, church. It is a gorgeous space. This room is a gorgeous room, so um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so, uh, us together was founded 20, about 20 years ago by two um, refugees from the former Soviet Union through what's called the Lautenberg Agreement, which is people who are religious minorities in the uh, former Soviet Union, there was a special arrangement to have them uh, be resettled. And so Nadia and Tatiana were resettled in Columbus. They um, met, they initially started working with refugees and immigrants in Columbus uh, in various, um, not resettlement ways, but community integration ways, social services um, that they knew were needed and this is before, you know, Columbus is a much newer city than Cleveland, and so their immigration path has been very different from Cleveland's. Um, and so the um, newcomer community in Columbus is much newer, right? That you know, you had Germans who came in the 18 in the 1800s, and there weren't a lot of new immigrants to Columbus until very recently. Uh, so there wasn't an infrastructure built up to support them linguistically or culturally. And so Nadia and Tatiana uh, founded us together and they initially started with language services. So they have a background in language access and they started an interpreter core, a translation core, and that has um, grown exponentially and we are a leader in not only Ohio, but really across the country in terms of um, a small regional organization providing um, language access training to various organizations and companies and governments, as well as private individuals. Um, so they've really done uh, an incredible job building that. And if you don't know anything about, um, about language access, uh, we have enshrined in our 1965 Civil Rights Act, uh, anyone who receives federal funding has to provide it in the language that the per is the person's first language. So there is um, some federal guidelines around language access, um, that were you know put in place um, in the middle of the last century. Uh, we have a long way to go though. It's one of those things that's not federally funded. It's it's a federal mandate without funding. <laughs> so um, it's good in word, but practice there's a lot of enforcement needed. Um, and so Nadia and Tatiana really expanded and continued to build on their organization and services. About 17 years ago, one of the national resettlement agencies. Um, was looking for a new partner and asked them to partner with them to do refugee resettlement work. 
Now, refugee, as defined by the UNHCR, is a very specific kind of person, right? And so you have to go through a very long process in your country of origin or where you have, you know, where you are in a refugee camp and you have to apply to be a refugee. We can talk very broadly about climate refugees, right, about, you know, people because of poverty being refugees, but that's not how the government defines a refugee. So there's a lot of um, terminological problems around what, you know, we could say lay people consider a refugee and what uh, the government will fund as a refugee. So, um, you know, many people are refugees of all kinds, but very few of them can actually get refugee status in the United States. So a refugee is somebody who the UN Human Rights Council determines is a refugee. And it's a very long process. Um, it can take years, it can take decades uh, to, to get resettled. So we have families who are like, now have grandchildren in camps across the world who still have not been resettled, right? So um, because of compounding problems, right? There, there are many reasons why this is a backed up process, coordinating governments across the world, all of these things. So the United States proportionally gets very few refugees per our population. Now, because we are a big country, we still get lots of refugees compared to smaller countries. But as a portion of our population, we get many fewer than countries like Sweden or Germany. So um, by the raw numbers, we get many more, right? We could, though, by function, receive many more than we choose to. So this is the number the president agrees to. He agrees to, or she in the future one day, agrees to a certain amount of refugees that we are willing to take in. And then there are nine organizations who are the RAs, the Refugee Ag Resettlement Agencies. There are nine of them, Catholic Charities, USCRI, um, L Lutheran Immigrant Refugee Services, Church World Service, ECDC, there's, that's five, there's four more. I can try to remember them all right now. Um, and then they work with organizations across the country, either in an affiliate site or um, a, a, a local site, right? Like a, a branch of their organization. So there's a few different models on how this happens. Um, and so we were um, an affiliate site of HIAS, which is one of these, uh, up until, actually up until this year. Um, and that is how we did resettlement. So you get... It used to be like $1,200, then it was like $1,800, right now it's like $2,200 per individual you agree to resettle. And so that covers a certain amount of um, direct services toward the individual, plus it, you know, money for running your operation and paying your staff. Now, Elizabeth, yes. is that the, the only amount you get, or is that by month? Uh, that is per individual. So it's twenty two hundred dollars to resettle an individual. Yes. A person in the family. Yes. So if you have a family of five, you know that's twenty two times five. If you have a single individual, that's twenty two hundred dollars. So obviously that's a minuscule amount of money. <laughs> um, but that's what has been decided, that's how the system works. Um, and then you as an organization will get an offer like Okay, your agency says we have 15 families from Congo. How many can you take? Can you take five? You can say yes or no. So then there's this negotiation about how many people you can resettle. And that depends on capacity of your organization, right? Um, the major problem with this, that's not the major problem. The major problem with this method is that the president every single year can change that number. And it's nobody's choice but the president's. So there's absolutely no way of lobbying to force the president to make a different choice. So it went down to like 6,000 people under Trump. It went back up to like 125 under Biden. But Biden, regardless of that number, has only resettled 22 of that 125. It's only welcomed in 22. So the number, it's, it's a very, it's very, you 2, know. 2,200. Well, 22,000 out of 100. And 25,000. Okay. That's, that's a fifth of what he could let it. Right? So this number is very arbitrary. And 
if it's you're getting paid per person, then the number of funding you receive from the government is extremely um, unstable and can fluctuate you know, immensely. So you're creating a very unstable infrastructure to resettlement, which is fundamentally the problem with how we resettle refugees. And remember, refugees are 11% in Cuyahoga County of the foreign-born population of, Ky of people in Cuyahoga County. So out of the, and we are 11% foreign-born in Cuyahoga County. So 11% of the 11% are refugees. So you also have to consider there are a whole lot of other people who cannot receive these services because they're not refugees. Now some of them don't need them. They're doctors, they're students, they don't need these services. There are other people who are undocumented or there are other people who, um, you know, our family reunification and still don't speak the language and still have health problems. Or now we have our Afghans and our Ukrainians who are parolees, which is not a refugee, which is a totally different classification, and also can't receive these services. Let alone talk about people with temporary protected status, like our Haitians, like our Salvadorans, right? Like our Guatemalans, that we've been resettling on TPS since the 90s which is a temporary status. So then you start to see the complication on who can I serve? What services can I offer? And how do I make sure that we're supporting our foreign-born population who needs support? It's extremely complicated, right? So the refugee resettlement model is, for that reason, one part of what we do. The other parts are the language access, the state-funded grants, the county-funded grants, the Health and Human Services grants, that we're able to provide additional services and programming for not just refugees in that, but also other individuals. Because you're also only allowed to receive services for refugees for a certain period of time. You're supposed to be self-sufficient within 90 days. You have three months to get a job, learn English, and pay your rent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, all this to say, we are grateful that at least our government has not, you know, abandoned us completely. But we have to have a very diverse funding model in order to stay open. So, like I alluded to, we do have funding from the state, from the county. We don't have any city funding because up until, I mean, still, the city hasn't really done that um, for any organization for, um, for refugees or immigrants. Um, so this past year, I was, I was lucky, I was, I was, I'm proud to say that I supported the city and the county in going through a certified welcoming process, which is essentially uh, an audit process to determine how inclusive your, your government policies are to ESL and foreign born residents. Um, so the county has started, they, they, they um, have completed their audit and they are in the implementation phase. The city um, is going through their audit, the city of Cleveland, the city of Lakewood could do this also, it's something any municipality can do. Um, but the fact that the, the county as a whole, right, um, because there are so many, there are what, 57 municipalities in Cuyahoga County, um, and so Richmond Heights has a lot of immigrants. Parma has a lot of immigrants. Lakewood has a lot of immigrants. So it makes sense that the county does it, right? At, but like I said, every municipality is welcome to go through this process. It's through um, uh, Welcoming America. is the national organization that put this process together. And so there are welcoming communities all across the country. And, you know, I, I've had a few people ask, well, why hasn't New York gone through it? Why hasn't LA gone through it? Why hasn't Miami gone through it? Well, because they were forced to create infrastructures to support a very, very large number of newcomers much, much sooner than smaller cities around the country. And this is a very methodical process, and so I'm hopeful one day that those larger cities will go through this because it does help plug a lot of holes and fill a lot of gaps, um, create, um, you know, reduce redundancies, you know, things like that where one department's doing it, the other department doesn't know that this department's doing it, all of those things. 
Um, so I'm proud to say that Cleveland and Cuyahoga County are going through this process. Yes. Um, if you talk about how the numbers are determined by the executive branch, mm -hmm. but the Senate decides how much money gets to be spent. I mean, we're, we're looking at a debt limit and all of that politics of that right now. Without getting too much into the weeds, this isn't just the executive, because if the money doesn't come up, how do you guys get paid? Correct. No, no. So my question is not to challenge mm -hmm. it, it's just saying, if I were to write somebody about this, who would I write? I don't you write, write both your senator, your representative, and the president. Okay. You have to write all of them. Because yes. our senators um, obviously have six years. Our representatives only have two. Our representatives from Ohio tend to be more anti-immigrant, despite people like J.D. Vance being married to a family of immigrants. It makes no sense. Um, so, you're speaking in the So, we, out of all the, the elected officials I've ever worked with at the federal level, every single one of them says, if people are not writing that this is an important issue, it will never be brought to the elected officials' attention. So do you have model letters? We do. You, and can you send those to Steve? Yes, I can totally do that. And there are listservs you can get on in terms of updates uh, for pieces of legislation, for example, that right now have no chance, but we continue to put it forward, hoping one day we'll build a coalition sufficient. Uh, because it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an issue that is not, is bipartisan. I mean, fundamentally, immigration is a bipartisan issue. Whether you like it for the small business startups that immigrants provide, or whether you like it because, you know, you have a soft spot because your grandparents were immigrants. You know, no matter who you are, there's a benefit to having more immigrants in this country. Uh, and for anyone who has questions about that, I am more than willing, later, to go into lots of reasons why they are helpful and don't, in fact, steal jobs. Um, so, uh, where was I? Uh, I'm not sure where it was. <laughs> um, we were talking about the Cuyahoga County. Yeah, the, the, the welcoming process. So we're very lucky here to really, we're starting to build an infrastructure um, that is more intentional around support. So Cuyahoga County put out a million dollar RFP last year uh, to support a navigators program. And so there are a couple of organizations right now that have, uh, are starting to build a navigators program for all kinds of foreign born people here um, who need some sort of support. And that is what it sounds like. It's a navigator <coughs> program of how do I do X, how do I do Y. And it, it's, it has individuals from, the, from various countries who have that linguistic and cultural knowledge to be able to you know, interpret that information back effectively. Um, this gets back into the schools, right, in terms of how the school districts handle it. It addresses uh, public benefits. How does our public benefits office address this? I will say JFS in Cuyahoga County has an incredibly good language access program, um, and so they do a really, really good job um, supporting uh, non-English speakers and immigrants uh, who need benefits. So, mm -hmm. and, and, um, some of us can stay longer and honor your time and stay, but it's uh, noon this afternoon. And so if anybody, uh, normally we end at noon, but uh, anyone who stays, can you stay? I can stay, and I, I, can, I can also give a quick wrap up for anyone who needs to. And what's the JFS? Is that the school where? Job and Family yeah. Services. <coughs> that JFS is different. Job, Jewish Family yeah. Services. Yeah. 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 Job, job and Family Services. Yeah, where you apply for food stamps, for SNAP, for TANF, okay. for your public okay. benefit. Okay. Right. Um, so, and, and actually, Cuyahoga County contracts through us together um, through our, we have the interpreter side of our business is a, is a social uh, enterprise. So it is like legally a separate organization from, from the resettlement side. Um, and so they actually contract with us for their interpretation and translation. Um, I can't tell you how many languages we do because I don't work with that side of the business. Thank you, for 60. Luda has. 60? 60. 60. Yeah. 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 Wow. 
which you can get to really quickly. I started a language bank at my former job, and I went from five languages to 35 languages within three months. So I mean, it's very, it, it gets it very quickly. You can add languages if you, you know, know what your target demographic is. Um, because remember, language access, this is a job only people who speak those languages can do. <laughs> it's not like being an engineer or something, you know, where, where lots of different people can be and you can only be a Swahili interpreter if you grew up speaking Swahili, right? Um, which is why it's a good first job for a, for a lot of immigrants or people who really have that communication um, expertise where they can build a full-on career for years and years doing this work. So yeah. here we are. And we're curious, obviously, interested. Can any of us be involved with US together in any way? Mm -hmm. So we have, um, obviously, financial support is you know the top of mind for every, every small nonprofit. Um, but we also uh, have family mentorship, where we partner individuals or, or you know, a family unit with a different family um, to provide support um, and guidance. And that is a very powerful model. If you have not been a mentor to anyone in your life or received mentorship, I mean, it's, it's, it's very powerful. Um, we have, uh, if you know people who are interpreters or who ever need translation work, you know, we are a reference for any of that kind of work. Um, we uh, collect various, you know, physical donation items depending on things going on throughout the year for what families need. And we um, send out those notifications to groups or to individuals. So getting on our mailing list is really helpful. Um, Ludo, what else am I missing right now? I'm missing anything. Transportation oh yeah, transportation training, that's a big one. Uh, when we need families who, for example, need to go to the doctor or need, you know, haven't gotten a driver's license yet, can't drive, it's very helpful to have many individuals on like, you know, the call list to be able to provide support with helping a family get to places. Um, and food donations, I mean, as, as that, that might sound, but there are many families we have with the price of food right now, it's, it's very hard to make ends meet. Yes. And do you want to? Uh, just sometimes we get like large donations, and half of our refugees cannot eat it, you know, because it's like uh, meat and stuff like this. So uh, if somebody wants to make, I would like to actually let us know. Them, because we have a list. We have a list of culturally appropriate yes. food donations, uh -huh. um, because sometimes that is an issue. You get something people just can't eat, won't eat, don't know how to cook. And, and then we have to then turn around and get to the food bank or something, and it's not doing what, what you want it to do. <laughs> like Ukrainians, they could eat anything, but they needed the less than other people do. That's why we have this list. Right, right. right. <clears throat> so, um, the, and I will just encourage anybody, if you ever, like asking the question is always the right thing to do. No question is stupid, no question is ignorant, because we just don't know what we don't know. Um, and there are so many people who want to do the right thing, um, and they donate things like flower vases. I I'm sorry, it's more than flower vases, right? Like, I appreciate, but, but we're, you know. <laughs> we appreciate vases too. <laughs> there's a, today in the newspaper, those of you who take the plain dealer, and Sid and I were noticing this, U.S. citizens get a chance to play role in resettling refugees, are you familiar with? Yes. The so, government's. Um, this is a new program called Welcome Core. Welcome Core. This is a brand new program that was announced on Thursday, um, and this is a co-sponsorship model, which is a model we currently are doing with four organizations. Uh, but you have to be at least five people. You have to raise $2,275 per person. You will have to work with a local group that does resettlement, and it is being organized by six groups across the country. And they want to resettle. There's a 10,000 and a 5,000. I think they want 10,000 people to help resettle 5,000 individuals within the next year. So, 
it's today, it's on A9, right. page 9. Right. But um, having done some of this mm -hmm. with your organization, mm -hmm. it, it's not as simple. <laughs> no, so you have it's not to, as simple as this. <laughs> you have to help the family find an apartment, help the family enroll the kids in school, help the family apply for public benefits, help the family get medical care, help the family make sure they've got all their vaccines in, vaccines in time and report those to the federal government, make sure the family has reported their change of address to the federal government, make sure that they have their, their address, they know how to do things like turn the stove on. We've had so many problems with appliances, people not know how to use appliances, right? Make sure that they are enrolled in ESL classes, figure out if they know how to drive or have never driven in their life and get them started on that track. Make sure they find jobs. It's a heavy lift. And there's a vetting process for the volunteers? Correct. You can make an application. The application is live to, to fill up to be a volunteer, right? Right. It's currently live. It just went live. I've not gone through the application myself just because I haven't done it yet, but I'm curious to see what's on the application. Um, that's the work we do. That's now the work they want normal people to do. <laughs> just... <laughs> We're hoping with the assistance of groups like us. That is not clear yet. I do have an informational session on this next week um, with one of the national organizations, so I am looking forward to learning more. Um, this started because people saw how well we did with the Afghans and Ukrainians, quote unquote, how well. And this is, um, if they want to put, the government is like, well, I guess normal people can do this too, so we're just gonna let you do more of it. I have a lot of questions about it. Um, not saying it can't work, because it can, but it does take a very determined group of dedicated individuals giving their time, their money. A lot of money. Oh, yeah. It I mean, if you have families with five kids, you've got to come up with $30,000. Well, not quite. I mean, yes, in terms of in kind and all, yes, totally, yes, 100%. Yeah. 16. Yep. So it's a well, plus housing. Exactly, right. Yeah. Yeah. First and last month's rent. Yep. And you got to get yep. in a place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The story about um, people coming into the country who are have serious health problems, are met at the airport with an ambulance, and are you know installed in top hospitals. That's very expensive. Do any of these medical institutions donate their time, or has this come out of the pot? Oh. Medicaid is paying for that. Every refugee who comes to the United States, they are eligible for Medicaid, and they basically from the first day they arrive, even if application made later, it's still backdated to the day of arrival. So if they uh, some services were provided on the first day, so they'll be paid. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And refugees do have to pay their plane ticket back to the United States. Yes. So whatever the cost of their plane ticket is, um, it is a way of helping them to establish credit because they come here with no credit, right? You can't rent an apartment if you don't have, you know, a lot of things you can't do without credit. Um, so this is one of the ways they help. Am I mistaken, or was there a program on PBS NewsHour this past week about mentorship programs across the country for refugees? I don't know, but I would not doubt it. Okay. And yes. I wonder if something like that is going to generate more interest, and is that what you need, is more interest? Have more public relations so that people understand and can get on that bandwagon? So it's a mixture. I think definitely more public interest is good because more public interest shows that people understand that refugees and foreign born people um, need help and aren't given the same resources as Americans are given. Um, but politically, what we need is different yeah. immigration laws. Okay. Like that's the real solution that we can't, we can't come to consensus yet. So you're talking about the number currently is about 120,000 people being let in, and where the previous the, the cap for it, yeah, and uh, the previous administration had dropped that all the way down to 6,000. Yeah. What was the criteria they were putting forward to uh, to narrow it down they don't to 6,000? They, they don't just can say that's the number. Okay, so where, who was making those decisions as to who is making? only who was actually getting in with that 6,000 because I mean mm -hmm. how do you make that decision when there's uh, you know so 120,000 plus the ORR. left out? It's the ORR, the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Okay. And when Trump proposed this, you know, did you hear 
he thought all all refugees are a threat to the United States. That's why he went that long. Mm -hmm. But all refugees are being so thoroughly screened by you know by you, You're you're screened. It's I mean, screened. more than if you want to be like a, a, a secret service agent. I mean, you go through the most extensive background check on the on the planet to be a refugee. So the refugees are not the people you have to worry about. They're not the threat for sure. <laughs> I was just thinking about the people who want to come from the south, these countries in the south. Yep. So this is all they can. They, can, this, can. they are not refugees. <laughs> they are awarded no benefits like refugees. They are not refugees. They're trying to come in, and what they can apply for is asylum. Now, most of them can't get asylum because the rules for asylum were created after World War II to basically apply to Jews. And so if you are not trying to be exterminated by your country for political or religious reasons, you cannot be a, an asylee. It's extremely hard to get asylum. And they are. That's why they want to come here. Well, they're being, a lot of it is poverty. And, and then poverty plus violence. But it's not because of an immutable characteristic of your personhood, which is what makes you, an, a, that's what makes you can get asylum. And that definition gets harder because going politicians refuse to recognize genocides for whatever garbage reason then you know a lot of those people who are being genocided aren't being recognized for it so they don't get that status so we have refused to support the violence and poverty in the southern hemisphere in the west or the western <coughs> hemisphere south well, you know the same way as we have in places in africa and asia and the middle east and if it were India on our border, we would be complaining about Indians and not Mexicans, right? It's a function of our geography, um, and it's mm -hmm. it's striking. Yeah, thank you. Well, Elizabeth, we want to thank you so much, Annie and Luda, for coming to be with us. Yeah. Luda really is the expert here. Luda is the bear, she's the backbone of the organization. Just gonna say. <laughs> uh, I, I want to stay in conversation with you for a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, if any of you want to stay for a few minutes with these folks, please do. We understand your time and schedule to stay, and it's a big football day, so we're going to Thank you so much. And you can always um, go to our website, usgether.us, to learn more. Thank you.